we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Okay, guys, come here. 
so good to see you. Um, can you say Barnabas? Barnabas. Barnabas. Can you imagine if your name was Barnabas? No, it's Barney. Barney, you go by Barney. Barney! So, Barnabas, the name Barnabas means encourager. So it's actually a really good name to have, even if it's the awkward. Yeah, you know what Barney is an encourager, isn't he, right? Because he's telling you that he loves you, right? Yeah, okay, good. Barnabas, guess what? There was a guy, and how many drives here? Um, there was a man in the very early church, when the church just, just, just started, named Barnabas. And the church was doing so many great things. It was helping um, talk to people about who God is and who Jesus is. And a lot of times when you do that, guess what? There's food involved, right? Yeah. You gotta eat. Yeah. Right. Coffee, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and so at first that was fine. It was sort of like a potluck. And then it was like, oh my gosh, this food is costing money. And then also the church wanted to help some ladies in the church who had uh, no husbands and no sons to help to bring money for them because you had to have a man to earn money. Um, and so the church likes to give... Uh, money to the widows in the church. So that they all think they needed money for that. They needed money for food. They needed money for the widows. And the church was like, where are we going to get this money? And this man, Barnabas, isn't it nice to know that the church has always been looking for money since like day number one? <laughs> but it's just a reality, right? And so there's a man named Barnabas in a very early church who said, you know what? I love what God is doing with all of this. I love that people are learning about God. I love that we're taking care of our widows. I love that we're serving food, and I know that we need the money to do God's work. So he had an extra like field of land that didn't have anything on it that he didn't really need to own anymore, and so he sold the land, and he gave 100% all of that money he gave right to the church. He said, I just want you to use it to keep on doing what you're doing, and people felt so encouraged, and then his mom was like, that's why I named him encouragement, because I knew he was going to do something wonderful like this, right? So we remember Barnabas because he was very, very encouraging to the church by being generous with what he had so that the church could do what it needed to do. Good story? Yeah. Are you going to name your kid Barnabas? No. Okay, good. <laughs> so today we have Games Sunday. Yay! We're going to call you Barnabas, David. David, you're an encouraging kid. Yay! Uh, back Barnabas. Okay, let's pray, guys. Yay. Lord God, we give you thanks for the encouragers around us. We give thanks for supplying the needs that we have. We give thanks for these kids and ask that you bless and protect them. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Yay! Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? 
and after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You would not just lie to the human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. A great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. After about three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter, Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How can you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband at the door, and they will also carry you out. At that moment, she fell down and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church who had heard about these events. I'm glad she knows so little of Satan that she doesn't know his name. That's good. <laughs> And I thought, what? And she said, it helps 
to have in mind what your takeaway, what your goal is for this hour that you will spend. And I thought, I was just coming to exercise, uh, okay. But then I thought about it more and I thought, no, I'm looking for flexibility, I'm looking for strengths, that's a physical thing, that's also sort of a spiritual thing. And it added to my experience of that yoga class to have taken just a minute to say, what is my intention for this time? I'm going to keep it short, but so we won't do it out loud. Let's think about your intention for this time. Why do you come? What's your intention this morning? What are you hoping to receive from this time? If we can define intention, it helps us know ourselves better. It helps us check our motives. I had a really interesting conversation uh, about six or eight weeks ago. I was at a birthday party of a friend of mine, and uh, it was a large birthday party. It was a big birthday party, you know, one of the zero ages. And um, it was with a, a number of Christians, this person's a Christian, a number of Christians from different churches, and somebody who I just know only just a little bit, uh, who goes to another church, and actually is really a leader in that church, uh, came up to me, and she was chit-chatting, and she said, oh, I heard about your breakfast at Alder State. And I said, yeah, that's great. She said, so tell me about it. And so I said, hey, well, we used to charge for it, and then we wanted to serve people the food pantry better, and the best way we found to do that was to offer it for free to everybody, and then, you know, it works out. And it's like a tangible expression of God's love. It's really good, and it's free, right? Just like God's love. It builds community, blah, blah, okay. And she says, really? And I said, yeah. And she said, why do you really do the breakfast? And I was like, what? And she said, why do you really do it? And I said, well, I told you why we do it, and she said, we get money for it. And I said, well, I mean, we you know, sell these placemat ads so we can sort of create a pad and a budget, and then people donate. If you want to know something, Jay Gurry, the Spicer's neighbor's friend of the church, donated a great part of the groceries for yesterday's breakfast, right? So people donate, people also contribute at the tables. So it works out financially, and we have never taken a loss at the breakfast, but we're not making a lot of money, no. And she says, oh, I really don't. And uh, it was like, because of what I told you. And she said, um, you do it to get people to come to church, don't you? And I'm, but the, like, yes, but, not like that. Like, you know, like the words, like the, the spirit behind it? You're getting people to come to church. And it was just the weirdest experience. And I thought, well, yeah, and we do want people to feel welcome to come here. Jeff and Lori Downs came, uh, one of the main drivers for them was that they volunteered for the breakfast and they ended up coming here. Eric was sitting right here. He came through the breakfast as well. Yesterday at dinner, we had, there's a guy who always sits here with a big puffy beard, Tin Cup Charlie. Sits up here at this table when he comes every month. Came to dinner church last night, right? Like, it, yes, it's a wide open door and it allows people to take the next step. So yeah, but it's not like, I'm going to go get like. It was just really weird, and I came away from the conversation like kind of like sticky. I was like, like, our, I think our intentions are good on this. Like, I, it's not like a sneaky thing, and it made me feel a little concerned. And I'm not trying to be judgmental, but a little concerned for the spirit of leadership at the church where she is. Because I thought, is that how they operate? Like, do they, um, you know, they want people to do this, so they sneak it around and do it that way. And I thought maybe that's why the church has a bad rap. And it just drove home to me again. Intentions, motivations are important outside the walls of the church, but from the people in the church, it is absolutely critical that our intention and our motivation always be to develop our relationship with God and to help other people know that God loves them. That has got to be it. That has got to be all. That has got to be only our focus, or people will see hypocrisy a thousand miles off, to the point where this church leader assumed that we act in hypocritical or self-serving way. That's what this story, Ananias and Sapphira, is about. Sorry, Sapphira. She told that. Okay. No blame. No joke. Loud. Ananias and Sapphira is about intentions. You can use this text to be like, everybody go sell your field, give me 100% or you're going to die. Like, that's <laughs> this text is really volatile, but that is not what is going on here. This is first, this is so early in the life of the church.
The church, this is in Acts, which tells us the story of the early church. Acts 1, Jesus is still walking around, boom, ascends, gone. Then Acts 2, Jesus sends, I think it's Acts 2, sends the Holy Spirit to the church, so now the church can do Jesus' ministry. And we have Peter, the Apostle Peter, preaching two amazing sermons, and people are converted in like the thousands, everybody's coming into this new Christian community. And like you get those beautiful paragraphs about the early church, about how they ate together and shared everything in common, and everybody got along. And it's just this glorious, gorgeous, idyllic, early, early baby church. At dinner church last night, somebody said, how long did that last? And I was like, mm, two weeks. <laughs> Four chapters. Not long. There's humans. There's humans. During that early part was when Barnabas sold his field and gave the money to encourage the church because the church has always needed money to function. That was the story I told the kids. There was a couple who was in the worship space when Barnabas announced his gift. And I believe Barnabas did it for pure motives. I really want to support this ministry. I want more people to know about God's love. And that was good. Ananias and Sapphira saw the gift and were impressed by it. But then they saw the applause that Barnabas got for his gesture. And they were like, yeah, I like that, right? It is so easy to be tuned into what the people in the room are thinking about you. It is so easy to look for validation from humans because it's right here. It's right in front of you. It is so easy to look for validation from humans. You can say, this is what I did today, duck face. Mm, good deed, right? Here's my loaf of bread. And, and then you look. 20 minutes later, but nobody liked this. What is going on? Like, oh, my privacy settings. And you change them, and all of a sudden, all the love comes in. It is so easy to get motivated by that. It's part of how we are, because we want to know that we're okay. And one of the fastest ways to find out is to look at somebody in the room and say, do you love me? Right? Do you love me? Am I good? And that's what Ananias and Sapphira were thinking. And so they go home, they also have an extra field. I want to be like this church with all the extra fields. We need to have more fuel. And so, anyway. so they, they sell their field. They get a lot of money for it. And they're like, you yeah, know, we did want to put an addition on a family room. And sort of wait it out and decided they wouldn't give the full amount from the field to the church. That's okay. Not giving 100% of that is not the problem. So making a smarter, wiser financial decision for the family is not the problem. The problem is that they didn't go to Peter or whoever in the church and say, hey, uh, we thought about it more and we realized our budget, whatever, we want to give generously and so we're going to give half the amount of the field. Totally fine. But if they had done that, they wouldn't have gotten the applause, right? And that was so important to them. So they didn't say anything. How's anybody going to know? It was a nice price they got. It's 50%. It still looks good. Okay, fine. So they go. Um, Peter is so full of the Holy Spirit right now, like nobody gets anything by Peter. And so he absolutely knows what is happening. So he calls Ananias over. And Ananias kind of thinks maybe he's going to get that pat on the back, you know, maybe get to sit in the front row or favorite row of the church now, something like that. And Peter just lays right into him and says, what on earth do you think you're doing? Since when did you think that that gift was a gift for the people around you? That gift was a gift to God. And you lied about it? Like, how do you lie to God about the gift you're giving? That's like an oxymoron. It's not even possible. Like, are you crazy? Except that you weren't even thinking about God, were you? You were thinking about the people around you. And you lied to the Holy Spirit. And Ananias was so convicted, he fell down and died. In comes Sapphira, three hours later. Uh, Peter gives her a chance, okay? He could have said guilt by association. But he says, hey, Sapphira, tell me about that gift. Was that what you got for the field, 100%? She said, yeah. But he said, don't lie to the Holy Spirit. And she also dies. They're buried next to each other on the same day. Now, that is really harsh and severe. So I did some thinking. What does this mean that they had to be struck down? And my best thought on it is that this beautiful, new, gorgeous, amazing, on-fire church that had just been doing such incredibly powerful work. But Sam and I were talking about it. This is like a, a baby church. This is still in the cradle. It's so brand new. It is so fresh. And so to have two people who would pretend to be in church leadership not have the right motivation or intention 
in the community, God couldn't tolerate. Could not tolerate. It's my best to understand. I still think it's severe, just me, Rachel. But think about it that way. It's sort of protecting this beautiful community that is just in formation. So we're being asked to check our intentions as a church, to, to think about why are we doing what we're doing. I'm going to share a story on myself, even though I, I have a couple things that made me look bad today, being my phone addiction. And, but here's another story. Uh, I'm going to tell you the truth, because I think I can handle you knowing the truth about this. Um, yesterday, during the breakfast, I get a phone call from Pastor Rick at the Congregational Church, who's my dear friend. Hey, Rick, what's going on? You coming to breakfast? He's like, Rachel, I have a funeral in half an hour. My dad is sick. Can you come here right now? It's, everything's written out. All you have to do is show up and read it. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah, I will. We don't, we don't know how his dad's doing. He's at Mass General. I don't even know if he's preaching this morning. Anyway, um, so you want to know the first thought that came into my head, or one of the top three immediate thoughts? Can you do a funeral for me at 11? Genuinely, Rachel in the flesh was like, oh good, we have some extra bills this month. It'll mean some money for us. Can you believe that? I'm sharing that with you so you know that this thing can be ugly. And I caught myself pretty fast. And I was like, like, you know, you're doing this for your friend. And so my point in telling that story of myself is that sometimes our motivations, our intentions aren't really good, right? If we're going to be honest. And we can call ourselves out for that. Like, you know, I actually don't like that that was my gut reaction. I hate that. And so I worked on myself. I said, I'm doing this for my friend. And he is probably not going to, you know, pastors get paid. That's how it works. And he's probably going to forget because he's distracted. And I'm probably not going to see anybody and that's completely fine. Because that's not why I'm doing it. That's not my motivation. So I corrected myself. I squared away my intention. And so this is what I'm saying to you. Be self-aware. What is your intention? And if you see a gut reaction you know, in the flesh, this is who I am, this is what happened, you can say, no, 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 that's not who I want to be. That's not the motivation or the intention that I want for this. And you can work on yourself for that and try to get yourself honest. It is really important for us to have good intentions and good motivations outside in the world. But in the church, it's absolutely essential. People will see hypocrisy a hundred miles off. Ananias and Sapphira were taken away from that community because of the damage that they would have done to their church had that influence become pervasive in the early church. One of the things I'm so thankful for, you know, that some people talk who remember about the church in the 1950s, like, hey, day, churches are full, everybody's going, it's wonderful, big budgets. Um, great. So I think also a lot of people went to see and be seen. I think it was like joining a country club. I'm sure there were also some really honest uh, believers in there too. But I think it was a lot more about status and posturing and the intentions weren't there. So one of the things I'm grateful for in 2017 is that these people here in this church are not doing this because it's the popular thing to do. <laughs> so that we can have approval from our friends. We're doing it because our intentions are, are hopefully by and large very good about saying I want to develop my relationship with God and I want other people to know more about God. So, see how I did? Four updates. And Dave. Kira, thank you. Um, see, I think I only got two letters this whole time. Uh, everybody's back on their phones, thank you. Um, <laughs> intention and motivation. So hopefully this, po this post was a sermon illustration, but hopefully even like what we're doing on social media, by the way. All of it. All of it. Inside the walls, outside the walls. Our intention is that we would grow in our relationship with God and that other people would know the love of God. Amen.
God, help us to be rigorously honest with ourselves as we work together as a body of Christ to witness your love to this world. Please accept this offering as one of the ways we say thank you for all you do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
There's a, we're doing a common reading this fall for anyone who would like to uh, about waking up white. So this is about white privilege and racism in our culture. It is a very interesting read. It is a challenging read. We're going to have two different times to discuss. Uh, it's late October, early November. I don't have it. But I do not have access to this book through CBD. Many times I do. If you want a copy, go to Amazon or go to the library. I get it on the reserve list. But we'll read it ourselves before we meet, and then we'll come together to discuss the ideas because they're provocative and interesting and challenging. Okay, George. So, two weeks ago, we'll watch people dig shovels of dirt. And uh, the hole's still there, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, uh, this morning, Rob gave me the check. Uh, hopefully on Wednesday, I'm going to be meeting with Matt. We are going to sign the contract. He has put forth a contract that's been accepted by the trustees. And um, we're going to be working on a start date. Probably that will be the end of October, the beginning of November that he will start the process of digging, forming, building. Um, his plan is to get the shell done and then start working on the inside. Um, and I'm sure he's not going to be wanting to have his guys up there working on the roof when it's cold, icy, or rainy. So I'm expecting that it's going to go pretty quick. So that's where we are. So I have the difficult, difficult uh, responsibility of uh, sending off a very important, so special uh, man in this congregation, uh, Paul Schaefer's new job in Philadelphia is going to start week from Monday, right Paul? Yeah. And so he and Suzanne are headed out this week to get him settled and begin the process of relocating. Um, but this is likely one of Paul's, last, well, yeah, one of the last Sundays in church until you come visit or get transferred back to Boston. So, um, so what I'd like us to do, um, I'd like uh, Kathy, George, and Eli to come on up just for just for a minute, and Paul to come up, and then also I need a microphone, and we're going to have just a couple minutes to say some words to Paul, and uh, we'll do a prayer. All right, so you know someone's shoes are really big when it takes three people to replace you. Um, and we actually, there's a fourth that we have yet to know. And that fourth person is the figure next to Kathy that we can't see. <laughs> um, but Paul has uh, most recently been uh, the chair of trustees and been managing the kitchen project, also been head usher. So um, Kathy and George have taken over the chair of the trustees position as a co-chair. Um, George is overseeing the kitchen part, and Kathy's doing uh, administrative paperwork, at parsonage, non-church, non-kitchen church things. That's not a small job. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the one of the most inspiring moments to be in the trustees meeting on Monday night and see how this team just stepped forward. And Eli's taking over head usher, also in a legacy uh, situation with your family, doing ushering. Uh, we do not. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We uh, do not know who the new Dr. Bacon will be. I'm still looking for new Dr. Bacon. Uh, but I thought I'd give us a couple minutes. Uh, if there's a word that anybody would like to share, you can either come up and use the microphone or shout really loud from standing in your Don't seat. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, the, re the real reason there's three of us up here is we're going to hold you down. It's going to change the building. Wow.
you know, may your next church also be chosen for the same reasons, and may, may, may you make the same contributions, and uh, we're very jealous of them. Yeah. But good luck, and may they, may they be as grateful as we are. Well, it is uh, difficult uh, to see you leave, Pablo. We're wonderful. We have wonderful hopes for where you're going in the next step. I know it's a great career move for you and a good move for the family. And so we trust you that this is a wise decision, even if it's hard on the rest of us. Um, I just also want to celebrate the church and the strength of this body. I was telling Sam after the trustees meeting on Monday, I was so encouraged to see Kathy and George step forward. And Sam said, our church has a really good bench. <laughs> Meaning, like, as a sports reference, like, when your principals move out, that there's a lot of talent sitting that's ready to step forward. Yeah, maybe that's why George painted the bench this week. <laughs> such a nice bench. But I thought that's totally true. There's such a great depth of talent. And um, so that's where I'm encouraged, Paul and Suzanne. Um, as hard as it is to see you go, um, I know that the church is strong and uh, hopefully gives other people opportunity to step in. So that's the comfort for me. Let's have a moment of prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for all times and seasons in our life and recognize this change of season for Paul and Suzanne and the kids. And we just ask that you would go before them. We, have, we thank you for providing this opportunity and do trust that it's from you, God, and that great things are going to come from it. We ask that you would comfort the shapers as they go, knowing that it's not easy for them, and also help us to be comforted. And remind us, God, that uh, you have known about this the whole time, and you know what the future looks like for them and what it looks like for Aldersgate. And we really trust you with that, because we've seen the abundance of your riches up to this point, and we believe that you are just absolutely ready with something wonderful for all of us as we step forward. So we have faith, we have confidence, we ask for comfort, provision, logistics, God, even logistics. Just help it to go smoothly for them and set them up in a new home. We pray in advance for the congregation that they will find and allow that to be a, an easy process for them, that, that that church would stand out because it fits um, their, their character and who they are. And so we send them um, with love and with joy um, and gratitude for all the years that they've spent with us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we have a little gift, a token of our esteem. Uh, George, a little card. This is from Breakfast Guests in the Church today. Says thank you, Dr. Bacon, and uh, Bobby Pierce uh, crafted this fantastic holy bacon, uh, which you should put on your desk with pride. <laughs> it was a toss-up. We didn't know if the, the the holy bacon or a Brillo pad. <laughs> so we tried. Here we are. Now I want my phone again. I got to post this. Somebody take a picture of Dr. Paul with his bacon. And, uh, <laughs> that almost didn't sound right. Cool. All right. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Let's take some pictures. tomorrow in this room. You can sign up online if you would like to do that. And um, after church, if there's someone you don't know very well, please go and say hi to them and learn their names. And as you go out into the hall, uh, there's some opportunities on the sign-up sheets board, liturgists and greeters coming up for the next few weeks. And as you go just a little further, uh, there's a little rolling table that has two items on it. One is your RSVP for the Taste of North Reading next Sunday afternoon at 5. If you are going to be there, even if you think you've told me, please put your name on that list so I can start getting an accurate head count from this church. Um, that event is coming together so well. It's really going to be awesome. And all we need is people coming through the door. People coming through the door. So the most valuable thing that you can do is say, hey, I'm going to be there, neighbor. Will you come with me? It's 25 bucks for a good cause. Just bring people in. It lets people know what Aldersgate is about, and it will raise a lot of money, $25 per person to the food pantry. The more people we bring in, the more success we will have. 
and the more bids on the silent auction and participants in the raffle, and that's what the church benefits from financially. So please bring your friends, sign up on the sign-up sheet. On that same little rolling table, there is a fundraiser from the what is now called the Ipswich River Community Corral. It used to be the North Reading Community Corral. Um, they rehearse in this space and have been here for 20 years. They're great. They, they helped us buy this piano, for goodness sakes. They do a fall fundraiser of coffee cakes. So if you feel like you want something completely bad for you and overpriced, that's your thing. <laughs> Was that a good advertisement? It's delicious? Okay, good. <laughs> but please do buy a coffee cake. They come in right before um, Thanksgiving. It's good to like take it, you know, if you're going to someone's house or something that you don't have to go. So, all right, celebration and thanks. Bonnie thanks Sally Meredith for doing the oatmeal and Suzanne Schaefer for doing the potatoes all the time. Amazing. All right, well, let's uh, celebrate Sally and Suzanne. Be with us all until we meet again in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.